in this lesson, we're going to go from Riemann sums into uh, sigma notation and how to find exact area with something called definite integrals. Um, starting with Riemann sums, I usually shy away from real mathy definitions. But um, in this case, uh, this is one example or one section of the book where I like to get into the Math League of America endorsed stuff. Uh, so here what I've done is I've taken Riemann sums and made it very generic. I just said use R sub n, so I didn't give you a definite number of rectangles. I gave you a generic function, f of x. I didn't even tell you where to begin and end. I just said a and b. Uh, and what I want to do is break this into Riemann sums. And if you remember, uh, your Riemann sums, the base of your rectangles is always some change in x. And then the height of your rectangle, in this case, I'm use, I told you to use right endpoints. So we'll use these heights right here to determine um, the heights of our rectangles. All right, so doing that, looking at my first rectangle, first I need to find delta x. And if you remember, my delta x is b minus a all over n, um, which in this case, there's really not much we can do with that because we don't have numbers for b, a, nor do we have a number for n. So uh, I may just keep it as delta x, just kind of keep that in the back of our mind. Um, and that may show up in another problem later. But uh, I do know that the base of my rectangles, I'll say this is R sub n. The base of each rectangle is delta x. And the height of my first rectangle is whatever my function's value is at x sub 1. And then my next rectangle is delta x times the height at x sub 2. This is my next rectangle. My next rectangle has a base of delta x times the height, which the right side of that interval is going to be x sub 3. Uh, and then this is really, I didn't give you a specific number of rectangles, so I'm just going to skip forward towards the end. And if we look at the second to last rectangle right here, the base of that rectangle is whatever the change in x is. The height is f of x sub n minus 1. And then my next rectangle is delta x. So this is my last one. I'm going to say f of x sub n, even though we do know that that point is b. But we're going to stick with f of x sub n to stay consistent with the rest. And now I'm going to play a little bit of algebra with this Riemann sum. Uh, I will factor out my delta x. And then I'm left with my heights at the right endpoints. So f of x sub 1 plus f of x sub 2 plus f of x sub 3 plus f of x sub 4 plus, and so on, so on, so on, so on, f of x sub n minus 1 plus f of x sub n. Uh, and this is pretty much the formula we've been using for Riemann sums. And uh, what I'm going to do now is turn this formula into a uh, into sigma notation, uh, a very, very I don't know, I may not review sigma notation. Um, so if I turn this into sigma notation, uh, actually I think I will a very quick blitz of sigma notation. If you remember way back in the day, you learned uh, sigma notation, okay, let's let n start at 1 and go to 4 of n squared. That meant we would plug in 1, and then we would add, throw in every integer up to 4. So 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared. And then we would add that together and get your answer for that sigma, um, for that summation problem. So what I'm going to do here is take this summation right here and throw it into sigma notation. So let me undo all this stuff. Whoops, too much. And I'm going to turn this into sigma notation. And really, the delta x is not a problem. It's all of this stuff inside. And the only thing that's changing is the subscript on the x. So this stuff right here... I'm adding up a whole bunch of f of x sub something, and that's the only thing changing, f of x sub something. And that something starts at 1, x sub 1, then x sub 2, then x sub 3, and it goes all the way up to n. And just for the sake of being consistent with pretty much every math textbook in the world, I'm going to call that x sub i, uh, where my i is starting at 1, and I do f of x of 1 plus, then I do f of x of 2, then f of x of 3, and I continue until I get to whatever rectangles, number of rectangles I'm doing. And this delta x right here, I'm actually going to throw on the other side, and we'll just make it part of our sigma notation.
And so that is our general formula for doing Riemann sums. Um, let me pull it up so you can see a little bit more of the problem. Uh, that is the sigma notation for doing Riemann sums. Now, the problem with Riemann sums is that you are getting uh, area estimates. You are not getting exact areas. Uh, so now we're going to start tackling the problem of how to make this a more accurate answer um, and how to make it an exact answer. So uh, let's see. If I wanted it to be more accurate, right here I'm taking, I think, nine. I counted this earlier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is nine rectangles. If I wanted it to be more accurate, I could simply take more rectangles, just cut this into smaller pieces. And so that's what I have right here. Exact same area, except I've drawn the rectangles a little bit smaller, and you can see that there's less error in our error in our uh, area approximation. So a, a fewer rectangles gives you a, a bad answer. The more rectangles you get, the closer you get to the exact area. And I'm going to pull in that same sigma notation. Um, this area, using right endpoints with n subdivisions, was, and it was the sum as we started at 1 and went to n, of f of x sub i delta x. Well, the more rectangles you have, the more accurate it gets. So if I want this to turn into an exact area, um, this right here is an approximation. If I want the exact area, then I need to take... See, I think I counted this earlier. This is 22 rectangles. If I wanted it to be exact, then I would need to get closer to, maybe if I did 100 rectangles. Um, but, but even then, there'd be some error. So maybe if I did 1,000 rectangles, or maybe if I did a million rectangles, this area would get a lot better. Uh, well, if I want the exact area, then the only way to get the exact area is if I were to do an infinite number of rectangles. So my exact area, we're going to have to add some calculus to this, some more calculus. The exact area, I'm going to take that exact same formula. The sum is I starts at 1 to n. f of x sub i delta x. I'm going to take that approximation, and I'm simply going to see what happens to this thing as the number of rectangles approaches infinity. So my exact area is found by this limit as the number of rectangles approaches infinity. And then we'll work out that limit, and that would give me the exact area. Uh, now, there is a mechanism for doing this and working it out with limits in these real long, uh, complicated formulas for the sum of the first n integers and n squared integers and all this mess. Um, but I'm going to skip all of this. What we're going to do when we do exact area, when I take the limit of this sigma notation, there's a little bit of math magic that happens. What this turns into, the f of x sub i, delta x turns into simply f of x dx, the same dx notation since, that we've been using since we started derivatives. Um, so f of x dx is from f of x sub i delta x. And then the sigma, that starts with an s. It represents sum. So that sigma transforms into an elongated s, which stands for sum. And then uh, to tell me where the area begins and ends, I will simply say the area from a to be. So this is the notation for finding the exact area under a curve from A to B. Um, and it is an integral sign that is an antiderivative, and antiderivatives are part of finding exact area. How are we on time? Okay. Um, so that's the sigma notation. We take the infinite limit of it, and it turns into this nice definite integral, and that is called the definite integral. Maybe I'll write that down. Definite integral. Is this exciting? All right, moving on. Um, so there's our definite integral. And the way we use the definite integral uh, is right here. The area under a curve from A to B um, is, and notice I changed from little f to capital F. It's capital F of B minus capital F of A, where big F prime is equal to little f. Or in other words, big F is the antiderivative of F. Um, now, a few words, a little bit of vocab, and I should have put this in here. Your A to B, that thing is called the limits of integration. And your F of X, DX, that's called your integrand. 
Um, so the way you work this out is you simply take the antiderivative of your function, you plug in the top number minus plug in the bottom number. And uh, I have a few examples where we're going to do that. And the mechanism, the, the using antiderivatives to get area is very easy. It's actually easier than doing Riemann sums. Um, so here are a couple of examples where I want you to find exact areas. So let's try this one. Um, the area from 1 to 4 of 2x minus 3. Well, if we look inside. This is my function. And the antiderivative of 2x minus 3 is x squared minus 3x. And then I'll plug in 4, and I'll plug in 1, and I'll subtract those answers. The notation for that is you put a vertical bar, and you write 1 to 4 like that, which simply means we're going to evaluate this function from 1 to 4, which is going to be 4 squared minus 3 times 4 minus, and then I'll plug in the 1. 1 squared minus 3 times 1. And clean that up. 4 squared is 16 minus 3 times 4 is 12. Minus 1 squared is 1 minus 3 times 1. 16 minus 12 is 4 minus 1 minus 3 is negative 2. And 4 minus negative 2 is 6. So the area under that curve from 1 to 4 is exactly 6. That is not an approximation. That is the exact area under the curve. Good, good. Good, good, good. Good, good. All right. Uh, let's try this one. Uh, same idea. Got to find the antiderivative. Then we'll plug in 9 and 4. Uh, before I do this antiderivative, I'm going to change the function. So I'm still going from 4 to 9. But I'm finding the area under. I'm going to change it x to the 1 half plus x dx. Let's find the antiderivative. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. And if you divide by 3 halves, you multiply by 2 thirds. Plus x, the antiderivative of x is x squared over 2. Add 1 and divide by the new exponent. And then we'll evaluate from 4 to 9. And here is where AP Calculus is really nice, because one of the things that you have learned in my class is that you do not have to simplify your answers. Uh, do remember to plug in your top number first. And when I do this, it's going to be 2 times. I'm going to plug in 9 to the 3 halves over 3 plus plug in 4, so 4 squared over 2. That's some crazy advanced math right there. Minus. Now I'm going to plug in. Ah, geez, I shouldn't have plugged in the 4. That was a 9. I'm plugging in 9 right now. So plug in 9, plug in 9 squared. There we go. Now I'll plug in the 4. 2 times 4 to the 3 halves over 3. Plus plug in 4, 4 squared over 2. And uh, if it is a free response question, you can actually stop right there. You don't have to go through the arithmetic. However, a multiple choice question, you will have simplified answers. So just for the sake of practice, let's clean this up. Um, 9 to the 3 halves, that is the square root cubed. The square root of 9 is 3. 3 cubed is 27 over 3 plus 9 squared is 18 over 2 minus uh, the square root of 4 is 2. 2 cubed is 8. So that would be 2 times 8 over 3 plus 4 squared is 16 over 2. 9 squared is 18. What is wrong with me? 9 squared is 81. There we go. Uh, let's see. Continuing to clean that up. Um, let's see. 3 goes into 27 9 times. So I can reduce that a little bit. 81 over 2 doesn't clean up. Um, 2 times 8 over 3 doesn't reduce. 16 over 2 is 8. And so now I'm down to 2 times 9 plus 81 over 2 minus 16 over 3. Holy cow. Crazy common denominators and stuff. Do I need to do all that? You know what? I'm lazy. I'm just going to throw that in the calculator because I don't want to take up video time doing that. All right, let's see. So I plug that in the calculator and I got 319 over 6. 319 over 6. And that's only for uh, uh, multiple choice questions. If it's not a multiple choice question, then you can leave it in this first form. I think I only have one more example. Oh, here it is. Uh, the antiderivative from 0 to power over 4, or you can read that the area from 0 to power over 4 under secant squared. So let's see. Secant squared, the antiderivative is, let's see, tangent x, all from 0 to power over 4. And we simply throw that in. So the tangent of power over 4 minus the tangent 
of zero, um, which if this is a free response question, you can actually stop right there. But if it's multiple choice, tangent of power over four is one minus tangent of zero is zero. One minus zero is one. So all of those answers are acceptable unless it's multiple choice, and then you need to give me the reduced one. So there we go. That is your uh, definite integrals and computing area under a curve. And you do need to know that it does stem from uh, those Riemann sums where you actually are taking an infinite number of rectangles to get exact area. And when you take those infinite rectangles, you end up with this beautiful, sexy, definite integral.